Okay, so remember last time uh, what we did. So we were talking about the complex uh, differentiation, okay? And so we were considering functions from uh, the complex numbers to the complex numbers. Or more precisely, we let A, more generally, we can let A be an open subset of the complex numbers. And we considered functions from C to C, uh, sorry, from A to C, I wanted to say. And then the big difference with, with real analysis, so I know there were some questions on this uh, last time, and I, I promise I will answer them. So within half an hour, you will hopefully understand the difference, but this is a much stronger notion of differentiability than the, the real counterpart. Okay? But so, really you can see the complex plane as being R2 in some sense. But you have an additional structure. So last time, you remember, we said that C was constructed by making R2 into a field. And what is so great about that? Well, one really good thing is that you can suddenly divide by complex numbers. Right? Because you cannot divide by vectors in R2 unless you make it into a field. So this meant that we could consider this, uh, this quotient. So we take a, some small a, some point in this set, big A, and we look at such, uh, such a quotient um, uh, f, of, is it f of a plus h minus f of a. Okay, or sorry, let me take uh, what, what notation do I want? Um, yeah. I use this notation. Divide by h, where h here is a complex number. Okay? So I could divide by this complex number, and this meant that instead of what we do in R2, do you remember we're talking about partial derivatives, and we have, you know, if you have a function from R2 to R2, you look at these coordinate functions, you have you know, f1 and f2, and you look at their partial derivatives, and you look at this matrix of, of all the derivatives, right? But now, all of a sudden, we can divide by this complex number. So this means that we really mimic the real one variable definition. And then what we get is something different, as will be clear soon. And then you consider this limit. Okay? And if this limit exists, then we call it, we say that this is the derivative, and we call it f prime of a. Okay? So in the, in the usual notation. And then we said that, so I wrote all this last time, so I don't have to write everything again, but then we said that f is differentiable at a if this limit exists. And okay, since this is a very key definition, let me just write this part. So then we said that f is holomorphic. Okay, and this will mean the same thing as analytic, but for the moment I will use the word holomorphic, remember? So, for analytic. On this set A, so remember what I stressed last time is that holomorphicity is not something that you are, you cannot be holomorphic at a point, but you're holomorphic on an open set. So you're always holomorphic on a neighborhood of, of some point, which makes it stronger. So it's holomorphic on A, so if and only if, um, F prime of A exists for every point in this, in this set A. Yes? Sorry, uh, when we are saying that f cannot be holomorphic on at least a point, mm -hmm. is that meaning that if f is a diff complex differentiable at point, mm -hmm. then this implies that f is differentiable at neighborhood of this point, necessarily? Um, that, is, uh, that is a good question. Maybe we can think of counterexamples. But, okay, let me just say it like this. So, the point of holomorphic functions is that you want to be able to expand them in power series. To be able to expand them in power series, you need to, I mean, this is always an expansion in some open neighborhood with this radius of convergence, if you know about this. Right? And so, you really need this to, to be defined, differentiable. I mean, this will automatically be differentiable in, in an open set. So, uh, yeah, let me think about if there is some weird example. Uh, yeah, I'd have to, I want to be sure before I say something. Okay. So this is what it means to be holomorphic, and now we will see sort of how can you recognize if, oh, if a function is holomorphic or not. So now let's pretend that I give you some uh, function in complex numbers. I give you 
sine of z times uh, e to the power z minus the absolute value of z squared or something. Is this function holomorphic or not? So, of course, we need some way of, of thinking about this. And in, you never really do this very much in real analysis, because in real analysis, it's very obvious. I mean, if it goes wrong, if your function is not differentiable, then it's for some very obvious reason. You know, it's uh, either it fails to be continuous altogether, or you have some kind of sharp edge like this. But in uh, complex numbers, this is really not the case. I mean, so if you consider this function, for example, so that sends, you know, f of, uh, so now I write my complex number as x plus i, y. If this is equal to, let's say, x, now viewed as a complex number, so x plus 0 times i, okay, this is not, uh, not holomorphic, okay? So this is not holomorphic. So you have, but of course if you, if you were just thinking of real analysis, then you would think that such a function is quite nice. Okay. The function sending x and y to, to x. It's not such a such a terrible function. But in real in complex analysis, this is not, no, not such a thing. It's not Sorry? It's not complex differential. Exactly. Well, it's not it's not holomorphic. Okay, so how do you recognize if a function is holomorphic or not? And the answer to this is something that is very central that anyone who took a course in complex analysis before will have heard of, for sure. And this is the so-called Cauchy-Riemann equations. So this is a first very, very key point. So now we come to the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Okay, and this would be a way to test. So, I mean, I will spend the next, I don't know, half hour or something to explain to you really how can you test if a function is homomorphic or not and how can you understand them, you know. So, this is the point. So, cauchy riemann equations. So, really the way you come up with this is that you consider um, necessary conditions for being homomorphic. So, you remember you have this set, this open set here, A, and you're at some point, A here, and then you want to approach this this point from different directions and in, in various ways and then this limit, you know, this limit f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h, it has to be defined whichever way you approach it. I mean h, when h goes to zero it can come from any direction because it's a complex number, right? So this is very different from, from the reals. But in particular there are, there are two, uh, two very natural directions you can consider in the complex plane here, you can consider let me draw it maybe here instead. You can consider that it comes straight from above, so just in the imaginary direction. Or you can consider that it approaches this point from the, the real direction. So you can just consider these two. And the limit has to be the same wherever you come from, but in particular it has to be the same for these two. So this is a necessary condition that the limit is the same for these two, and actually it will turn out to be a sufficient condition. And this is what the Cauchy-Riemann equations are all about. So let us uh, consider this. So consider, okay, so that is my notation here, x plus i, y, where x, y are real numbers, as usual. And there are many ways, uh, so there are many ways in which some other, you know, coordinates here, if we are in R2 now, so x tilde, y tilde, there are many ways in which this can approach the point x, y, right? Or if you want, there are many ways that x plus x tilde <laughs> plus i, y tilde can approach x, y. So this is what I said. So in particular, so in R2, thinking of this is c. So in particular, we will consider these two ways. So we will consider x plus h, so now h is a real number, okay? Um, goes to x, y, as h goes to 0, h is a real number. And there is another way, which is that x and y plus h tends to x, y, where h goes to 0 and h is a real number. Okay, so this corresponds to, so let me get my colored chalk to make this remark. Uh, 
So this corresponds to something like this. This corresponds to uh, letting z plus plus uh, h go to z, and this one corresponds to z plus i h goes to z, something something like this. Okay. So here I am sort of freely making the identification between R2 and C, but I, I hope that everybody is, is following this, uh, this step without any problems. Okay, and so what do we get? So in one, now we want to compute this, this uh, limit. So okay, so again, so I should remind you, so I said this last time. So what we consider is that we consider this f of z. We write it, you know, using two function of real, two real functions like this, because it's real and imaginary part, where u and b are defined on R two, but they take values in the real numbers. Okay, so we don't take values in R two or something like that. We take values in the real numbers. So we can always write it like this. This is clear, but we can always decompose a function. And then because the Riemann equations are about, about these two, so in one, what we have, so if we approach it in, in this way, then we have f of z plus h um, minus f of z divided by h. Okay, I mean so I am using the same letter H because if I use various letters, you know, it will, I cannot come up with, with this many letters. But now H is, is real. Okay. So in general, it could be, be a complex number when I wrote the definition. But right now, we think of it as, as a real number. Okay. So I hope you can bear with me and try to keep this in mind just for, for the moment. So now H is a real number. So what is this? So using this decomposition here, it is equal to U of X plus H, Y. Um, divided by h, uh, sorry, yeah, minus u of x, y, divided by h, and then plus i times v of x plus h, y, minus v of x, y, divided by h. Okay, so everybody agrees on this. And then this is equal to well, what is this? So when you pass to the limit here, so let me put it this way. So when you let h, this real number, tend to zero now, mm -hmm. then of course this is just real analysis all of a sudden because we're using this u and v, which are real functions. So what this is, is just the partial derivatives exactly. So this is partial u, um, partial x, okay, uh, plus i partial b. Okay. So far so good? Is this clear? Very good. And now we look at the second case. Okay, so the second case. Now we approach this point Z from another direction. So in the second case, we look at F of Z plus I H minus f of z divided now by i h, okay, so h is a real number, and we want uh, this to go to zero. So let's see what this is. So this is equal to u of x, so now y plus h, okay? Is this clear? Because of course now I'm moving only in the y direction, okay? So this is equal to, um, yeah, actually. I wanted to just take this out first, so this i is kind of annoying, so let me just write it like this. So you know that 1 over i, do you know what that is? So this is the most basic exercise possible in complex analysis. 1 over i is equal to minus i. Okay? So this is equal to minus i times all of this thing. Um, okay, and that way I'm I don't have to keep remembering this i h in the, in the denominator. Okay, so this is equal to minus i times 
u of x y plus h minus uh, u of x y over h minus i times all of this. Um, okay, plus uh, so let's see, have I forgotten an i here? So plus an so minus an i. Let's see. What am I doing here? Plus i. Plus i. Plus i. Plus i. Okay. So this is equal to, in that case, so it is equal to minus i times the partial u, uh, now partial y, right? And then minus i times plus. i squared. So this is plus partial v partial y. Is this correct? Okay. Very good. It tends to this. Okay. As h goes to zero. Okay, so we have these two things. So if you approach it from above, so to speak, from the imaginary direction, the limit is this. If you approach it from the real direction, okay, the limit is this. And so by definition of being holomorphic, the limit when you approach it from any direction has to be the same. So in particular, so f holomorphic, so now f holomorphic implies that these two things have to be equal. So f holomorphic implies, so when two complex numbers are equal, it means that their real, real parts have to be equal and their imaginary parts have to be equal. Okay? So this means that the real part here is partial u partial x. So partial u partial x, this should be equal to whatever the real part is here, which is this, partial b, partial y. And then you look at the imaginary part, so the imaginary part over here is, so again, I want to stress this, the i is not part of the imaginary part. The imaginary part is just what is written in front of i. So it's partial b, partial x. So partial b, partial x is equal to minus partial u partial y. Okay, and this is what is called the cauchy Riemann equations. Okay? So these are the cauchy Riemann equations. So, so far we have shown that if f is holomorphic, then they have to satisfy the cauchy Riemann equations. Okay, so in particular, you see not every function satisfies this. So, again, if you look at this example that I gave, so you know, you look at, so now I, will, I apologize for writing very small somewhere in a, in a silly place on the board, but f of x plus i y equals to x. Okay, so then this means that u of x y is equal to x and v of x y is equal to zero. And what do you get? So, partial u, partial x. Okay, it is 1, partial b, partial y, it is 0. Already we lost the game. It is not holomorphic. So you see, many very simple, very simple functions from real analysis are not holomorphic. Okay? So this you can see. Okay, any questions uh, so far about the Cauchy Riemann? Okay, so in that case, So I will write them again, the cauchy Riemann equations. So now we will have one of the central theorems that showed a miracle that not only are the cauchy Riemann equations uh, necessary conditions, okay, you approach from the imaginary direction, you approach from the real direction, of course the limit has to be the same, but you would think that it's very possible, very plausible that something else can happen, something more complicated, that even if both are the same, then some other limit can be, can be different. But we have this theorem, okay, that says the following. So suppose 
u and v from R2 to R uh, satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. Okay, so I will in this course I will write this the CR equations. Just to not try to the CR equations. Um, and partial u, partial x, partial u, partial y. So all the partial derivatives here, partial v, partial y. So all of these, sorry, yeah, you had it, we are continuous. Okay, so this is important. If you don't put this hypothesis, this kind of theorem may not be true. Um, so I will hand you the homework sheet later, and there will be an example of something where this is not, where this theorem is not true. But it doesn't mean that this theorem is wrong because I have this hypothesis. Okay? So we are continuous. Then f defined by u plus i v is holomorphic. Yeah, it's a holomorphic function uh, on on a. Yeah, so actually, so on A, I'm sorry, I will put instead, I will put here some A inside of R2. So more generally, I want subset. So of course, when I say I have a subset A of C or a subset A of R2, you know, they are completely, topologically, they are completely the same spaces, okay, and they're even isometric. So I can really pass like this in, in the same way. What I cannot do is, you know, R2 is not assumed to be a field, but then I have to say C if I want to divide by complex numbers. Okay, so this is uh, a very important theorem. So if the partial derivatives are continuous and we satisfy these Cauchy-Riemann equations, then your function is actually holomorphic. So this is kind of a uh, kind of miracle. So let's see if I can prove it directly. I think I should. So let me give a proof of this. So proof. So the proof is not too hard, but it's I think very instructive to see how, how this is proven and where the Cauchy-Riemann equations uh, are used. So by a uh, sort of calculus, so a real calculus, real analysis, so using, um, so it follows. So the point is we're using precisely these hypotheses. So this is something in real analysis, right? You have the partial derivatives and they are continuous, okay? So using precisely this hypothesis, we have the following. So we can write, um, so now I will take A and B to be uh, any two real numbers, okay? So I write U of X plus A and Y plus B. So I move in, in both directions. So minus U of X, Y. So I look at such a, such a difference. So this is equal to, and now this is not a, a good place, so let me put it here. Pick A, B, and R. Okay, so then you get what? According to standard calculus, you get partial u partial x times A, plus partial u partial y times B, and then plus some remainder term, epsilon 1. Okay, so I will tell you in just one second what this is. I'm going to do the same thing for v. Uh, so y plus b minus v of x, y. This is equal to partial v, partial x times a, plus partial v, partial y times b, plus epsilon 2. And where is epsilon k over h, so k here is 1 and 2. So it goes to zero as h goes to zero. Um, okay, and uh, k here is, of course, one or two. So do you agree with this? So this is what you what you learn in in multivariable calculus if you, if you took such a course. Okay, so this is a fact for multivariable calculus. Now let's see how we use it. So we assume, so far we haven't used the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Now I just said that the partials exist and they are continuous. Okay? So then I can do this. So now, if f equals u plus iv, um, is holomorphic, uh, no, sorry. So 
satisfies the Cauchy Riemann satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations. Then, so what do we have to show? So we want to, so we say we satisfy Cauchy Riemann. We have this, and we want to say that the function is holomorphic. So what do we want to show? What does it mean? So from basic principles, if we go back to the definition, being holomorphic, so now we have to prove that this function is holomorphic, f equals u plus iv, we have to look simply at its, this quotient, f of z plus h minus f of z divided by, by h, where h is some, some complex number, okay? So we have to, have to look at this. Okay, so here, now I've used a and b here. So now what I'm saying is that this corresponds to me, this is our, our h, right? Okay? So f of z plus i b, so minus f of z. So now we will see what this, uh, what this equals. Okay, so it is equal to u of x plus a. So we have uh, all of this. So it is equal to u of x plus a, y plus b. Uh, minus u of x, u of xi. So, I mean, of course, I will divide later by a plus iv, but let me keep it like this for, for a moment. So it is equal to this, um, plus plus this thing, um, plus i, yeah. Thank you. Because f is equal to u plus iv, of course. Okay, good. Thank you. So I have my i here. And then we use this. So what is it equal to? It is equal to partial u partial x, a plus partial u, partial y, b plus epsilon 1. Continue over here. Uh, okay, Okay, yeah, so I mean, I could just tell you what I will get at the end of this computation, but I feel that it's one of the first proofs we do, so let's just do it so it can really convince you. So it is equal to this, I continue here, plus i partial b partial x a plus i partial b partial y b plus i epsilon 2, okay? So is this correct? Yes. And now the question is, so what does this equal? So I have here on my paper that this is equal to, so let's see if it's true. Okay, sorry, so I should do this first. So now I'm using the Cauchy-Riemann equations here. And then, so what was the, what was Cauchy-Riemann? So let's remind ourselves here. So Cauchy-Riemann was that partial u, partial x. By the way, I never remember Cauchy Riemann. So, you know, I will tell you later what I remember instead. And you can also try to do the same. So I never remember which one it is, but it's like this, partial b, partial y, and then um, partial b, partial x is equal to minus partial u, uh, partial y. Okay, so now we use this. And we'll just plug this in here. So let's change all the partial b's for something in partial u. So then it is equal to uh, partial u, partial x, a, plus partial u, partial y, b, plus um, then i times partial b, partial x, so partial b, partial x is here, so it is minus i, partial u, partial y, and then times a, and then plus i partial b partial y, so plus i partial u partial x b, and then plus epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2. So this is our sort of remainder term that will go to 0 when we divide it. Okay, so we have these things, and now let's see if this is not equal to partial u partial x, plus i partial u, uh, ah, shit, is this a u or a v? It's probably a v. Ah, shit, okay, I messed up a little bit. 
Anyway, this is going to be equal to length. So let me let me see. I am sorry about this. So let's use the Cauchy Riemann equation. So what I wanted to say was that it is equal to this. It is equal to partial u, uh, partial x. So let's see if we can find this. Plus i partial b partial x times a plus i b plus epsilon one plus i epsilon two. Okay. I'm sorry for having you erase this thing. Uh, so let's see now why this is true. So we can we can check it backwards. Okay. So of course, so this is equal to partial u partial x a uh, plus i partial u partial x b plus i partial b partial x a minus partial b partial x b okay and plus plus this remainder term. So now let's just check with the Cauchy Riemann equations if this is true. So now we're checking. Okay, so we had partial u, partial x times a, we had over there. So this is accounted for. Partial u, partial y, b. Uh, okay, so partial u, partial y, b, we don't have here, but partial u, partial y is equal to minus partial b, partial x. Okay, so minus partial b, partial x, b is here. So this one is accounted for. Then we have uh, partial b, partial x, okay, times i, a, this one is here. So this is good, this one is accounted for. And then partial b, partial y, b. So partial b, partial y is partial u, partial x. So we have i, partial u, partial x, b. So this one is accounted for. Plus the i epsilon 2 and the epsilon 1, the other. Okay, so we have, we have everything. Okay. Good. So my calculations, my claims were not lying. So we have this. Okay. And we are convinced this calculation is true. So now what this means is that if you look at f of z plus a plus ib minus f of z divided by h, h is a plus ib, okay? Then this is equal to, you divide that by this, so it's equal to partial u, partial x, plus i, partial u, partial y. Okay? And so, in particular, the limit, as this goes to, goes to zero, exists. So, in particular, limit, as a plus i, b, goes to zero, uh, exists. Okay? And this means, that f defined by u plus iv is homomorphic. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So limit exists. So plus epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2 over a plus iv. This is true. And the point was that this, according to what I wrote here, these are things that will always uh, go to zero. Okay, yeah, but I'm sorry, of course I should write this and include that. Thank you for pointing it out. So a limit exists and the limit equals this. Because this thing, this part goes to zero and this thing is. Thank you. Uh, I didn't understand something. Yes, please. But um, for example, in functions from R2 to R, mm -hmm. if we take the limit uh, in the sense of R2, limit of when x, y, for example, down to x0, y0, mm -hmm. if we prove that the limit exists under all lines, mm -hmm. which reach the point of not apply that the limit exists. No, that is good correct. Statement. Yeah, so but here I see that like we take only the lines. Mm -hmm. But that implies at the end I see that limit exists. This is what I also we uh, we uh, we use that uh, the function satisfies the Cauchy Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but but um like we take only the directional derivatives here, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I cannot understand. So we don't we don't take all possible curves going to. No, 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 we don't. No, it's it's what I'm saying with this theorem is that it's really enough if you have so the partials have to exist. Okay, yeah. and we have to be continuous and satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. Yeah. And then this part of satisfying the Cauchy Riemann equations, this yeah. is where the magic is, you know? 
So this is where everything is, where everything is hidden. So if you satisfy the cauchy riemann equations, then by a miracle, if you want, yeah. these bad things cannot happen. Because you're actually holomorphic. And you're actually, that actually means you have a power series expansion and you will never have this phenomenon of, of approaching, uh, approaching it in, uh, in different ways. And uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Can we change the condition of theorem that on the uh, U, U and V, V functions are differentiable? If the, the partial uh, derivative is uh, continuous, then it's always um, uh, differentiable. Yeah, it's okay. differentiable. Yeah, the partials have to exist, of course, and, and uh, it has to I be think that we can change the theorem's condition that this function is differentiable. Yeah, so there is like a whole bunch of literature uh, on how to optimize this uh, this uh, this condition. Like, if you can if you can change it a little bit, and there are results. But um, I think we should be a counterexample to that. But we have theorems with a lot of conditions, a lot of strange conditions that you could put yeah. that are also equivalent yeah, to it. I, I am sorry, that it's yeah. enough differentiable. Is enough differentiable? Yes. Okay. Um, I, have, I, I doubt that, actually. I doubt that. that we will, uh, we'll see. I mean, okay, so anyway, the elementary proof. I mean, if you want to give a proof like this, you really need to use this kind of expansion. And then you need the, uh, need the uh, partials to, be, to exist and to be continuous. Uh, for, for this argument to hold. Um, then there are many more involved proofs that try to push, uh, push to the limit this kind of uh, conditions to see if something else is also equivalent to this. But, I mean, anyway, this is equivalent to being holomorphic. So whatever you can prove is equivalent to be holomorphic has to be equivalent to this condition. Mm -hmm. like you know? Doing is using the expansion? Is that the part where it is used? Sorry, so you need continuity. I mean, when do we use the continuity of the partial derivative? Yes, yes. Okay, let's see now. Okay, so then we can give a okay, counterexample now for what I said at the beginning. We can choose two real functions such that the, the partial derivative at zero zero is all zero, mm -hmm. but it's not holomorphic. Because it will yeah, satisfy sure. the Cauchy Riemann, but it's not holomorphic. So uh, I mean, I mean yeah. it satisfies the real Cauchy Riemann equations only yeah. at one point. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah you can try to construct. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so being holomorphic is equivalent to. To this uh, this uh, this condition. Well, actually, okay. So if you're holomorphic, I should say that. It. So if you're holomorphic, then you satisfy the Riemann, and if you have this wrong condition, then you can go back. So it's actually, yeah, it's actually not a problem. Okay, and maybe maybe differentiable yeah. is is enough. Enough because yeah. it's a differentiable. We can get this um, this equation at least, and uh, yeah. and everything can stay the same. Okay. Yeah, so according to your colleague, he has studied that some, uh, this differentiable is enough. Um, yeah, so why am I not giving this differentiable? So this is the standard one that you use in complex analysis courses and in books, simply because this is the one that has an accessible proof. Okay? And this is most often enough, and it's not always, you know, the purpose is not to always push the hypothesis to the strongest possible theorem you can get by tweaking and looking at these counterexamples. So for almost all purposes, this is already enough. Okay? So then you can ask yourself these questions, like if you really want to get into these matters, you can study what is the optimal condition such that Cauchy Riemann is enough to go back to, mm. to holomorphic. And uh, people have published many articles on this. Okay? So in my research, I have not studied this kind of questions, so I have not read all these papers. I don't know the optimal conditions, but you know, this is something that you, you can think about. So if one day you know, you're going to write a diploma thesis at the end of this thing, maybe you want to study what is the optimal <laughs> condition in recursion Riemann equations. This could be a good thing. You could read articles, you could understand more subtle arguments, and, uh, and you could do this. This is one of many questions that, uh, that is possible. But for the, for the course, this is, uh, this is the theorem I want to present. Okay? And, uh, yeah, and in the homework, I have an example um, so this function, so f of g is uh, 
uh, so it's e to the minus uh, 1 over uh, z to the 4, I believe, if z is not 0, and uh, it is equal to 0 if z equals 0. So this will satisfy Vicochi Riemann equations, but it is not tolomorphic. Okay, but I will not, uh, I will erase this because uh, you will have to tell me why in the room. So, and prove. <laughs> this is okay. Okay, so let's see. Uh, examples. Okay, so the simplest example is first, so f z equals z. Is this holomorphic or is it not holomorphic? Okay, and a, so a is our open set where the function is defined, it can be the whole of complex numbers, of course. So is this one holomorphic? Well, we just have to check. So, very simple example on how to use Cauchy Riemann. So, in this case, u of xy, was there a question? No. U of xy is equal to x, v of xy is equal to y, because z is equal to x plus i y. Okay? Okay, so we have this, and then what we get? We get partial u, partial x is equal to 1. Partial u, partial y is equal to 0. Partial v, partial x is equal to 0. Partial v, partial y is equal to 1. Okay, and Cauchy Riemann equations, what did we need? Well, we needed this one, let's see now if I can remember, but we needed this one to be equal to this one, which is okay, and then we needed this one to be minus this one. So this is also okay, because minus 0 is 0. Okay. Uh, oh. And it continues. <laughs> Very good, yeah. <laughs> this example was so simple, I was not too. <laughs> okay, so that's the okay. case. So F is holomorphic on all of, all of C. Okay, so this is what we will later call an entire function, by the way. This is a, a word if you're holomorphic on the entire complex plane, you're called entire. Okay, and now an example. So I already gave an example in passing, but let me properly give an example of something which is not holomorphic. <coughs> okay, so the most standard example, this was one, the most standard example of something which is not holomorphic is f of z equal to z bar. Okay, so z bar is, of course, you remember that z equal to x plus i y and z bar is equal to x minus i y. Okay, this is the complex conjugate. And then, so we have uh, u of x y equal to uh, equal to x and v of x y is equal to minus y. Okay, and you see what will happen. So partial u partial x, these are the same, partial u partial y, but here you will get the minus one. So here you will see that partial u, partial x is equal to 1, which is not equal to, um, to partial v, partial y, because this is equal to minus 1, okay? So hence, it doesn't satisfy the cauchy riemann equation, so we don't even have to worry about if it's continuous or not, but it is. So f is not holomorphic. Okay, it's not holomorphic anywhere. Okay, it's not holomorphic in even a tiny open set anywhere on the plane. It's just not holomorphic. Not holomorphic anyway. Okay, so any questions about about this example so far? Because if not, I will show you the way that I think every complex geometry, anyone who does research in this, thinks about Cauchy Riemann not in this way, but in another way, which is how I also remember Cauchy Riemann. I think it's, it's much easier. Because here, I mean, I always get unsure which one is supposed to be equal to minus the other one. And this is, I don't know about you, but of course, if you have an exam or something, you can make sure to remember it. But in real life, how do you remember Cauchy Riemann? So, you know, if someone asks you on the bus or something, what is Cauchy Riemann? Okay, so alternative way. Uh, 
to think about the Cauchy Riemann equations, which is very useful. So, uh, think of z and z bar as independent variables. Instead of x and y being independent variables in R2, okay? so we're used to thinking of an x-axis and a y-axis, then you could think of z and z bar sort of as independent variables. So this is a little bit hand wavy, so very something so all this analysis where z and z bar is independent variables, this has been formalized and this is not really part of this course, how you formalize this and make it absolutely rigorous. Uh, this, these are called, like when you take partial derivatives this way, they are called the uh, Wiertinger derivatives and such things. So I mean, if you're interested, you can read about this. But let me just, you know, pretend that everything is, is rigorous that I'm saying. So it is, can be made. So think of Z and Z bar as independent uh, variables. Okay? And, yeah, and F. Um, so think of it as f of z, z bar, as a function of z and z bar, instead of x, x and y. So first you have z is equal to x plus i y, z bar is equal to x minus i y, so this means that x is equal to one half z plus z bar, sorry, and y is equal to 1 over 2i times z minus z bar, okay? Because, of course, when you add this to this, you get 2x. When you divide by 2, you get x. And you do a similar thing with the other one. So, you have this, this relationship. And now, <coughs> okay, so by a sort of uh, chain rule, so now we have consider a partial derivative in z bar. Okay, so this is one. So what is the partial derivative in z bar? So let me write, um, uh, write what this. Okay, so it's equal to, well actually let me, I want to explain where this comes from maybe. So if I want to explain where this comes from. So think of the chain rule. So let me put this in orange, because it's a little bit of a parenthesis. So by the chain rule, Okay, you want to think of uh, partial f, partial z bar, or of this function f of x, y. You want to think of this as partial f, partial x, times partial x, partial z bar, right? And so I'm writing this plus. So this is really the part where I'm saying that this needs to be, this has been formalized, you know, what exactly these partials should mean. So partial y, partial z bar. But as you know, it's still very useful, I think, to motivate where this, this comes from. So we have this. So then we have, let me now write the proper one. So therefore partial f, partial z bar. It's equal to, so partial f, partial x, and then partial x, partial z bar, what is this? Well, partial x, um, partial z bar, it should just be one half, okay? So it's equal to one half, so this, think of it as one half, partial y, partial z bar, think of it as what? So it should be minus one over two i, okay? And minus one over two i, so it's equal to i over two, if you want, okay? So therefore I can write this as um, one half times partial f partial x plus i partial uh, f partial y. Is that correct? Okay. So this is the this is the. So if you want, you should think of this as a definition, and then you should go and read about the. You know, in mathematics, when you go to undergrad, you learn that you can differentiate a function. And then when you go to graduate school, you start learning that there are 25 ways of uh, defining a differential in various cases in mathematics, where 
the normal differential doesn't really make sense and we have to give it a, a meaning, okay? So this is now called the limiting and derivative. But don't, don't bother about this. This is completely unimportant for this course. Just take this as a definition. And this is the motivation for why you can think this is the good definition. Okay? Because otherwise it looks like Z bar, so you kind of thought maybe you should put a minus here, but okay, for this reason you want to put the plus. Okay. Um, so we get this. Um, so now with uh, f of xy equals u of xy plus i times v of xy, uh, we get what? So then we get partial f partial z bar. So it's equal to one half times, and then partial f partial x, then what you get is Okay, partial u, partial x. So I will just write down the, the end result and we will check it. So you get this, plus i times partial u, partial y, plus partial v, partial x. Okay, so what you do is you put f equals u plus i v here, okay? So you will have the differential of u over x, so it's here. Then you will have i times partial v partial x, okay, so it's here, i times partial v partial x, then you will have plus i times partial u partial y, so it is here, and then you will have plus i squared partial v partial y, which is minus partial v partial y, so it is here, and the one half was always in front. So you get this thing, okay, and then hence, partial f, partial z bar, so this is the point, equals zero, what does this mean? So partial f, partial z equals zero, if and only if, well, you have a real part and the imaginary part. So complex number is zero, if and only if, the real part is zero, and the imaginary part is zero. So if and only if, partial u, partial x, is equal to partial v, partial y, and partial u partial y, or I think I wrote it this way the other time, partial v partial x is equal to minus partial u partial y. Okay, and this, what is this? These are exactly Cauchy and equations. So the way if you're wondering how a uh, sort of a researcher in complex geometry or complex analysis remembers or thinks of Cauchy-Riemann equations, we think of it like this: partial f, partial z bar equals zero. Okay, so I think this is uh, this is very nice. And so if I don't remember the Cauchy-Riemann equations, to remember them, I would do this: I would remember this or know this, and then I said, okay, so this is zero. When? Well, this has to be zero, and this has to be zero. So this is this is how it goes. So now, of course. It is even easier to come up with examples of holomorphic or not holomorphic. I mean, it's much easier to understand when a function is holomorphic or not. So for example, the example I had here with f of z equals to z bar, now it's completely obvious that it is not holomorphic, right? Because when you differentiate in z bar, the different, well, it's, it's 1, which is not 0. So it's not holomorphic everywhere. And so now we can also get uh, some other example, we can get a more complicated example, like if I take uh, sine of z uh, plus module of z squared, is this holomorphic? No? No. Yeah, because this thing is equal to, you will remember, it's equal to z times z bar. So when I differentiate it, it is z. Okay, so if z is 0, maybe. But if z is not 0, then for sure this is not differentiable. And you cannot be holomorphic in just one point, so this is not holomorphic. Okay. So this is an example of something complex differentiable at one point. And yeah, I just wrote, wrote this down by accident, actually. But yeah, I just wrote anything I could think of. It's a random thing. Yeah. <laughs> Check whether the function is or, more, uh, or, or just Absolutely, yeah. it, it just gives us an indication. 
No, this is uh, absolutely, I mean, this is absolutely rigorous. This ah. is how you think of it. So partial left, partial z bar. Yeah, but uh, partial, partial z bar mm -hmm. is defined this way, but can we just define, uh, can we just differentiate uh, as the usual partial differentiation? Yes, you can. I mean, the I mean, yeah, you can imagine that this is a, a real variable and you can use all the roots. But they are not uh, actually uh, independent, right? No, so I mean, in complex analysis, so you would see sometimes these rules for differentiation need a slightly different proof. You know, you have to prove them. Uh -huh. But uh, so for now, I can I'll just tell you that someone has proved them, proven them, and you can use them in the same way. And then the course will go on, and we will discuss uh, many things, and you will see in part two things. Okay. This is um, okay. So the answer was this is not polymorphic. If you want to to write it down. Okay, because I mean, otherwise, if you think of the cauchy riemann equations in the way I first presented, then I think it's very hard. You have to sort of, you see a function and you have to actually compute its derivatives to understand that. Now, as soon as you see a z bar in there somewhere, you should be very suspicious <laughs> if this can actually be holomorphic, okay? And if not, if I just wrote uh, sine z, cosine z, e to the z, uh, you know, something like that, then you'd say, oh. I mean, you don't know it yet, but. They will be, they will all be holomorphic. Okay. So, uh, corollary is that any polynomial, so, um, so it is a polynomial, it is something like this. I know you know what the polynomial is, but let me write it as a final term like this is polymorphic. Okay. So this is a query. So I will just say it orally. There are two proofs of this. So one proof is that if you differentiate with respect to z bar, then it's zero. This is one way to think about it. And I can do this because it's a finite sum, okay? So soon we will look at power series where you have an infinite sum and then you have to be critical. You have to be worried, can I actually differentiate term by term when I have an infinite number of terms. So we will discuss this. But when there's a finite number, that's okay. So then this is holomorphic. Uh, the other way of seeing it is that we showed using a very basic cauchy riemann that just f of z equals z is holomorphic. If you multiply by a constant, you can easily see this has to still be holomorphic. The power is And then, yeah, so then you're going to use this fact that you can check easily that sums of holomorphic uh, functions are holomorphic, and products of holomorphic functions are holomorphic. Mm -hmm. So then you can put together these few take the powers, and you can sum them, and they are still still holomorphic using that just z is is holomorphic function. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, one proof. So just to have written this on the board, that sums and products of holomorphic functions. So my abbreviation now for holomorphic starts to become polo, okay. Are holomorphic. Okay, so this is one way to, to prove it. <coughs> okay, but I am really giving this as, a, as an introduction more than anything else. So what if we have, um, what if we have a power answer? So what if we have infinite series. So an infinite series sum of a k z to the k where k goes from 0 to infinity. Okay? I can write 0 to infinity. What if we have this? Then we cannot just do the same argument because when I say sum some products it is finite sum some products of course. Okay? So does this make sense? Does this define a holomorphic function or not? You would hope that it does, but here you really have to say something. You have to study power series. The answer would be, uh, yes, it defines a holomorphic function, but not on the whole complex plane. It defines a holomorphic function up to, I mean, in, a, in an open set. And how big this is, is determined by the radius of convergence of the, of the power series. Okay. So, 
Let's do this. So, power series. So these things, by the way, are called power series. Okay. This is the terminology. Okay, and so the first thing we will do is uh, recap on uniform convergence. Okay. So, okay, so now I'm starting sort of a new, uh, new section of, of the course. Now I'm going into transitioning from Koshi Riemann into, into power series. So if you have some more questions on Koshi Riemann, uh, you know, ask me after, after the course. So, we got an uniform convergence. So let's say that we have x, y uh, metric spaces. Okay, it is not extremely important right right now that you remember all the axioms of a metric space or something like that, but you know a space that has a metric. So for example, C. Okay. Of course, we will be interested in C, but since it holds for all metric spaces, I'm writing temporarily x and y metric spaces. Okay, and then uh, you consider a sequence of functions fn from x and y. Okay, so the definition is that if you have such a sequence of functions, um, sorry, okay, consider this, and then the definition is that fn converges to f uniformly uh, on x if and only if for every epsilon there exists an n such that so this d now is my distance in this metric space that I have, okay? So for example, I told you in C this distance would be given by the absolute value, so this is absolutely the usual distance in, in R2. Okay? So if you're confused about this metric spaces, think about C with this distance. Okay? So D of uh, Fn of, uh, of x, F of x is less than epsilon, and this holds uh, for all n greater than n and for all for all x and x. So of course the uniform part is that you can pick the same epsilon for all the x. Mm -hmm. If it's not uniform, you will remember it's for every x you have an epsilon such that we exist an n over. So this is the uniform part, that you have the same coordinates. So I think, I mean, all of you have seen this, but just uh, as, a, as a general introduction. And now, So it is nice to just uh, remind you of, of an example. So the non-uniform convergence example. So you can take Fn from 0, 1 to 0, 1. This goes to so these are metric spaces by restriction. Okay. Um, so you have this, so you have 0 and you have 1. Okay, and then, whoops, sorry. And then you can take fn of x to be x to the power n. Okay? So then what do you get? So, of course, if n is equal to 1, you just get this thing, and then as n grows larger, you get something like this, and it's, it's not supposed to go below, of course, but you get something that's, that goes to this. So in the limit, as n goes to infinity of fn, so it is equal to fn of x, so it's equal to 1 if x is, is equal to 1. Yeah, okay. I thought you were correcting me, so it was good. But <laughs> okay. And then 0 if x is not equal to 1. So it is 1 here, and then it's 0 everywhere else. And this is not even a continuous function. Okay? So there appears in the limit, there appears a discontinuity. So yeah, you should, you should be, be aware of this. So this, uh, this is discontinuous. Uh, 
However, we have the following theorem okay, that says that if Fn converges to F uh, uniformly, and Fn are all continuous, then this implies that the limit is also continuous. Okay, so this is actually important, because this will be used in, in many proofs. So you saw, see here what happens when the convergence is not uniform, then you can get the discontinuous limit, but if you have continuous functions that converge uniformly to something, then the limit is also continuous. So this will be used. So I will not prove it, but it will be used. This is sort of standard. Standard argument. Okay. So that was the short recap on uniform convergence. Let me now get into power series. So a power series is a series of this form. So some, so actually, okay, I'm using N here as for electric. So let me try to stay consistent of this form, where a, A0, A1, and so on, are given um, complex numbers. And Z uh, is a variable, OK? It is the plot of us with complex variable. So you have such, such expressions. And of course, the point is that here we have an infinite, infinite series. So we have a problem. So uh, does not always converge. Okay. So sometimes or very often, I mean, typically this series could be could be infinite. You know, for example, you could take almost anything, like just sum of z to to the power n. Uh, z to the power n, where z is equal to 1 or something. I mean, this does not converge. So of course, this thing converges if the absolute value of z is less than 1. But here it's not converging. OK? So in this case, this is a good example of something that converges inside the unit disk, where it's absolutely convergent, but outside it goes to infinity. And what this will tell us, so once we have gone through this section of power series, we will know that this will define a holomorphic function when it converges. So this will be holomorphic in the unit disk, but it will not be, be defined outside of the unit. So this is where we're, where we're going. So the question is, uh, for which z, that's this uh, series here, let's call it star, does this converge? Okay. So let's see what how much time I have. Twenty minutes. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to give you tools so that you can start on as many homework problems as possible after today. So let's. See. Okay, so we have this theorem. So the first uh, very, very big uh, theorem on, on power series is, uh, well, actually, I should give a definition first. So first, let R be defined as the following. So it's the supremum of all the non-negative R's such that all these terms are bounded. Um, <coughs> so it's a bounded sequence. Let's put it this way. Okay, what does it mean to be a bounded sequence? It means that there exists one constant that is larger than all of them. It's not that for every term in the sequence you can have a constant. That's, of course, not what it means to be a bounded sequence. Okay? So this is a bounded sequence, uh, of course, including this A0, it's very true. But, uh, 
what are these? So this should be a bounded sequence. So the terms of this um, of such a series should be bounded. So this is called the, the radius of convergence, okay? You don't know it yet. So um, yeah, so let me remark. So R equals to plus infinity is possible. Okay. So this you should you should remark. And R is called uh, or it will be called um, the radius of convergence. Okay, so so far I haven't related it to anything, so so far it doesn't make sense, but you can keep this in mind. This is what I would call the radius of convergence. And the reason is because of this theorem. So let this be the, the R. So first of all, if now Z minus A, so of course A is this given point. So of course you should think that you have, a, you have somewhere in the complex plane you have this A, and then you have a power series expansion in a ball centered around, around A. So this is how you should think of it. So if the distance, so let's say that the radius of this ball here is R. Okay. So if if now you are outside, so Z is further away than, than this ball, which will, you know, you will see later this is somehow the optimal uh, ball in which in which things converge. So if this distance is greater than R, then uh, the series here, that I still call star, it diverges. Okay, so if it is further away than this ball, then it's not convergent. Two, if it's inside, so important, strictly inside here, okay, so not on the boundary, but strictly inside, so this is important, uh, then the series star uh, converges, and not only does it converge, but it converges absolutely. So converging absolutely means that if you take the absolute value of all these term by term, then this thing converges, and it converges uniformly. Okay, so what this means, I reminded you 10 minutes ago. And it converges uniformly uh, on this set where z minus a is less than r. It's less than r. So it converges on all the on any compact on any closed disk here. So on any any compact set in the interior it converges uniformly. So this is what it means. So on any compact. So uniform convergence on any compact. In this disk centered at A and with radius R. So, this is what I call this disk squared. You remember the notation. Okay. So, on any compact subset of this, it converges uniformly. And on the disk, uh, I mean, on the boundary of this disk, in general, you don't know much about convergence. So, warning, uh, so warning, when the absolute value is exactly equal to R, we do not know much. In general, not much is known. So, be aware of this. So often you have to, you can use this thing, you can compute this R, and then you have to check somehow by hand on the boundary. This is a typical, uh, typical thing to happen. Okay. Um, so I think I think what I want to do is I want to state first also this theorem. So how to compute it? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, I have a problem with the definition above. Uh, yes. It says the supremum of all greater than zero. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, such that the sequence a zero p one r a two r squared uh, is a bound as a bounded sequence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the sequence uh, the the series uh, z uh, to the n. Yes. Uh, satisfies uh, for r equal one and all the a's are one. Yes. It will be a one of bounded sequence. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay. Okay, yeah, but it's, it's still divergent, but I mean, this is on the boundary of your oh, list. Yeah. So that's why you want to. So this goes under this warning here. Yeah, okay. that's, your, that's your own boundary. Sure. Yeah. So how to compute R? Okay. So normally I had planned to say this. Uh, I will talk more about this soon, but I just want to state the results so that you can, uh, you can start on more homework problems, let's say. So I will get back to the proof of this. Let me just state it now. So one over r. So I think I mean I think you have seen this normally in undergrad. So this is why. So the limb suit as n goes to plus infinity of a n, the absolute value of a n, and then you to the power of one over n. So you take the nth square root. Okay, and this is equal to one over r. And then b, so r is equal to the limit another way. And this is important if the limit exists. Okay? Limit alpha. Sorry? Limit alpha in general. Ah, okay. But so if the limit exists, it's equal yeah, to it's equal to this. Yeah. Okay. So this is called the uh, the root test or something like this, and this is called the uh, equation. Yeah. Ratio test. It's called, I think, in English. Okay. So this is how you can how you can compute it in in practice. Okay. So now that I've stated it, let me go back to uh, to talking about. The next part here. So I have this theorem. So now I want to prove the theorem that if you define R in this way, then uh, you're convergent uh, on in the interior of this disk with radius R centered at A, and you're divergent outside and on the boundary you don't know. So I want to prove this theorem, and to prove this theorem, uh, you will use. Uh, something called bias plus M test, which is a very, very useful theorem, uh, which we will also use to prove our theorems later in the course. So, so you should remember this. So we take this an open uh, subset. You consider a sequence of functions from A to C. Of course, here N goes from zero to infinity. Then you suppose the following. So this is the key hypothesis. That is why it's called, I mean, so many people think this is a very stupid name, M test. So, because if this thing is less than or equal to M times A N <laughs> for some, some M, uh, for M and some M negative, and all Uh, a n, I don't know why. I'm, uh, yeah. Of course, yeah, a n has to be positive because I'm talking about the absolute values. Okay, so if we have such a thing, this hypothesis here. Okay, uh, and then this has to be such that the sum of a n converges. So this has to be. Fine, okay? So if you have this, then, so okay, this is also part of the, the hypothesis. So then what we have, then the sum of Fn of Z converges uniformly on A. 
Okay, so this is about uniform convergence. And you can already imagine why this is very useful. Because you see, if we can, we are studying some kind of sum. And if we can show that every term is bounded in such a way with something that converges, then we know that this sum actually converges uniformly to something. And so if every, if all these terms are continuous, so maybe the terms are polynomials, like in a power series, then actually the fact that it converges uniformly to something and it is continuous means that the limit is actually continuous. So this way, by applying this theorem, we'll actually be able to see that such power series, the infinite series, will actually define a continuous function on, on A. So I mean, now I'm going a bit fast, I will give the details, but you can actually see it's already continuous, and then we will in addition go on and we'll prove that actually it's differentiable and how you can, how you can differentiate uh, these things. Okay, so we have some five minutes left. I think that's actually enough to give a proof. Okay, so proof. Um, proof of the M-test. Okay, so first note uh, that if you look at the sum of the absolute value of these things, then what is this? So let's look at our hypothesis. So we said that each each term. So we have we start with some sum. Okay, we want to we start with this sum without the absolute values. And we want to show that this converges uniformly to something. Okay? So we start by noting that if we take the absolute values of every term, so we can study absolute convergence. Okay? So if we start by this, then each such term is less than m a n. So this is less than or equal to m times the sum of a n. Okay? And the sum here is always from 0 to plus infinity. Okay? So it's equal to this. Uh, and this is finite, okay. which implies that um, sum of f n of z, so I will not always write this, uh, what, what n it goes from, converges absolutely on n. So this is the, the first, um, first step, so for any, any z in a this converges absolutely. Now we have uh, the following uh, claim, fact, uh, exercise. Uh, this is, so this is not hard. This is easy. I mean, you, you have seen this one million times in real analysis. In complex analysis, you can deduce it from the real one. This statement that an absolutely convergent uh, complex series so this is the keyword here, otherwise you know it already. Complex series is convergent. I'm sure you can believe this by analogy with real analysis, but you should really prove it in the complex case. And this is exercise uh, five in your homework sheet. Okay. This, is the, this is not the hardest exercise by far. Okay, so you have this fact. So I assume this since you will prove it in the, in the homework. Uh, so all of this, thanks to this, we see that sum of Fn converges. And what does it mean? So it means that these partial sums, so from n equals 0 to big N of Fn of z, so this converges to, uh, to something, to some s of z, okay? So it converges to some function. So now we have, we want to show that we have uniform convergence, but now we started by showing, okay, at least it converges to something. Now we have something to hold in our hand to study how does it converge to this, to this object s of z. Okay, um, yeah, you remember this. We want to show that it's uniformly convergent. How can we finish the proof? 
So, um, so we must study the difference here, okay, of these things. So this is equal to the absolute value of the sum going from n plus 1 to infinity um, of fn uh, of z. And this is less than or equal to, uh, to of course, if I put the sum inside. Okay, so this is what I want to do. If I put, so, sorry, the absolute value is inside. And then, again, you remember the hypothesis that this is less than or equal to m sum of a n. Because each such thing was less than or equal to m times a n. And this was assumed to to converge. Okay, uh, but what does it mean that this converges? So now this means that for any uh, epsilon there exists some n uh, prime such that for any n greater uh, than this n prime we have all of this. Okay, so this is what it means. Or sorry, it so means less than epsilon. Such that we have all of this. So this is what it means. And of course this last step is because this sum is convergent by hypothesis. This was part of the, what we asked uh, in the theorem. Okay, and so what does this mean? Well, this actually means that sum of fn converges absolutely. That uh, converges uniformly. On a. And this finishes the proof. So let's just recap where did the uniformity come from? Well, the uniformity came from the fact that using the hypothesis, this difference is independent of z. Okay. So I put any z, but I ended up with this bound that does not depend on z. And this came from assuming the hypothesis. So therefore, this is uniform. So for any z, I can take the same epsilon, namely this epsilon. Uh, so if the sum is uh, starts on the uh, greater than the capital right? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, yeah, it's actually this is actually also true. Uh, yeah, because all the terms are positive, and so I added even more things. But it yeah. cannot be less than epsilon. Sorry. But it cannot be less than epsilon. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay, this starts again plus one. You're right. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, let me just give one very quick example of, uh, of how you use this. This is one line. Then I will give you your homework exercises and then we, we stop. Okay, so very quick example. So we can go back to the same example as earlier. So we look at sum of z to the f. So this means that fn of z is equal to z to the n. Okay? And so we have, and then we look at a to be the this disk. Let's even take it to be the, be the plus disk for sum are less than 1, okay? Then because r is less than 1, then this zn is less than or equal to, to rn. Well, I mean, this is always true. So the absolute value of fn of z is equal to this. And, of course, the sum of rn converges because r is less than 1. Okay? So now, the m test, so virus test, m test, therefore implies that sum of Zn converges uniformly on this disk for any r less than 1. Okay, so it converges to something, this limit exists, 
And since all of these partial sums, so if I stop at any finite number, this thing is continuous, then what the limit will also be decontinuous. OK, so let me stop there. Next time we will continue uh, seeing how we can rigorously differentiate these, these power series. OK, and so before you go, I'll, I'll give you